Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the study, the second study on Daniel's last vision. And uh, we're going to um, begin with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the time that we have this morning. As we come together to examine uh, your word, especially this relevant uh, vision of Daniel's that has created so much controversy uh, within this movement. We just ask, Lord, for your Holy Spirit to direct our minds, to give us wisdom and understanding, to see things clearly, and to correct any errors that we may have. We ask that your spirit can work upon each heart in their personal study, and that you can work upon the heart of those searching for truth, that they can come to understand the truth for themselves. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so, um, we had, there's a number of questions that came up. So, a few different points that we have to address. So, yesterday we went through uh, a bit of the chronology of uh, Daniel chapter 10. So, we established that it's in 536. It's in what would normally be characterized as the first year of Cyrus, even though it's referred to as the third year of Cyrus. So we're going to clarify some things on that point. Um, so it's going to be in the spring of 536. He's going to begin uh, to fast on the third day of the first month. That's seven days before you would normally have uh, the Passover lamb chosen. And uh, he's going to finish uh, you know, 21 days later on the 24th day of the first month, which is what it gives us in the Bible, the three full weeks. So we're taking three full weeks as being uh, 21 uh, days uh, complete. Now, it is possible that he's starting on the fourth day, that it's an inclusive count. So on the fourth day of the first month, so if you count from the 4th to the 24th inclusively, then it's 21 days. So it's either or. Uh, I don't know if there's any particular symbolism that I find in either of those start dates. Um, but in the 21 days itself, I've suggested that that 21 days represents the 21 years. And those 21 years... Um, if you are looking, you can switch to the screen because I left up the camera there. Um, and so I just switched it here on my recording, but you would have to do that yourself. If you want to look at the other item there with the whiteboard, you can see it's got the 21 days um, are going to be represented there with those 21 years from 607 to 586. That's the 21 years, I believe, that the 21 days is representing as a day for a year. So he's fasting for that period of time. And then there's 49 years um, to, to complete those 70 years in the fall of 537. That's when the accession of Cyrus occurs. He only calls it the succession of Cyrus to the throne that occurs within about two years of the fall of Babylon. And that statement within about two years always means less than two years, but close to being two years. So when Darius dies, Cyrus comes to the throne. And then about six months later in the spring, he's going to issue the decree. My belief is that the decree is being issued on the 24th day of the first month. So Daniel is fasting, and then on the 24th day of the first month, at the end of three full weeks, he is given the answer, which we're going to look at, to his prayer and, and what that means, what we believe it means. Now, um, Stephen had pointed out, so I'm going to do 
this, just hang on. So Stephen had pointed out um, from Daniel chapter 1, verse 21, when I was talking to him about it. And Daniel continued even unto the first year of King Cyrus. So you can see that there. Uh, the first year of King Cyrus. If he continued unto the first year of King Cyrus, and it talks about the in the third year of Cyrus, then this statement would be wrong unless the third year of Cyrus is also reckoned as the first year of Cyrus. Does anybody not understand what I said there? That's a, that's a little convoluted. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So when we look at chapter 10, and it says, in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel. I'm taking the third year here to be the third year from the fall of Babylon, not the third year of Cyrus as king of Babylon. That is, he becomes the king of Babylon in the fall of 537, the first year of that reign, because you would have a succession year, the first year as being king of Babylon would be the spring of 536. But here, Daniel calls it the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia. So Daniel, it says, as you can see, in 1 verse 21, he continued even unto the first year of King Cyrus. So that means we have to understand whatever that first year of King Cyrus is, it can't be something that's uh, shorter it, like it's, it has, it can't reach shorter than the third year of King Cyrus in chapter ten, because the third year of King Cyrus in chapter ten has to be the the year that Daniel continues unto, right? So if he continued unto the third year of King Cyrus, if it said that there, then we would just say, well, those are the same. But since He's in the third year of King Cyrus and also the first year. We have to know that that first year and that third year must be the same year. So it's just, it's designated two different ways. It has two different counts, two different ways of counting. So, so this is something I had to deal with quite a long time ago. And uh, the way that I addressed it was, um, the way that I'm telling you here is that we have this, uh, I'm going to just find the slide here so it shows it a little bit better. So, switch the screen. Okay, so <clears throat> we can see here we have the fall of Babylon, 539. And then I have two different counts. Um, we can count the first year of Cyrus just all the way through here from the fall of Babylon. Or I can just recognize that this is Darius the Medes' first two years as king of Babylon. And then when he dies, I can count Cyrus's reign starting in 536. So I believe in Daniel 1, verse 21, it's using this count here as the first year of Cyrus. And in 10, verse 1, it's using this as the third year of Cyrus. It's the same year. It starts in the spring of 536. Does that help? It helps a bit. Now, another thing that's important about all of this is that we have a time of the end. So this is their time of the end, right? This is the 70 years. 
that's ending. And it has two different events. That is, there are two actually two different 70 year periods that are being marked. There's a 70 years for Babylon. Um, and that 70 years for Babylon is the one in Jeremiah verse um, chapter 20, is it chapter 29? I always forget. I think it's Jeremiah 29. Let me look quickly. Um, yeah, so in Jeremiah 29, verse 10, for thus saith the Lord, um, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you. So this is this is the 70 years of the Babylonian captivity. This is the at Babylon. I will visit you and perform my good word toward you and causing you to return to this place. Here, I should show you this screen. <clears throat> so there's Jeremiah 29, 10 here. So that's the 70 years, what we normally call the Babylonian captivity. In chapter 25, even though it says the 70 years of captivity, this is not the 70 years of captivity that's going to be talked about in chapter 25. Um, it says, um, verse 9, Behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, saith the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land, and against the inhabitants thereof, and against all these nations round about, and I and will utterly destroy them, and make them astonishment, and in hissing, and perpetual desolations. Moreover, I'll take from them the voice of mirth, and the voice of gladness, and the voice of the bridegroom, and the voice of the bride, and the sound of the millstones, and the light of the candle. And this whole land shall be a desolation. And in astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. So this is the period for Babylon. It shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished, that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans and will make it perpetual desolations. So you can see here that there's this 70 years in which at the end of the king of Babylon will be punished. So that would be the fall of Babylon. So that's going to be October 13th, 539. But we see also that there was a 70 years at Babylon, and that's going to be ending in this period. First, the 70 years are going to be completed. That is when Cyrus comes to the throne, but there's a process that's going to go on. And that process is going to be, he's going to issue a decree about six months later. And, and in that process of even issuing that decree, there's a battle going on in Cyrus's mind, which we see is this great controversy, chapter 10. And then uh, he's going to issue this decree. The Jews are going to return to Jerusalem. And on the first day of the seventh month, they're going to set up an altar in Jerusalem, right? And that would mark the beginning of that jubilee here. And so we're going to talk about that as well, try to understand why there's this 49 years um, and then the 50th year. So um, my view is that the 50th year is uh, this year of jubilee which the Jews could have experienced 50 years before, 49 years before. Instead, they experienced the destruction of their temple. And we know that, and, and their city, of course. And we know that the whole issue around these four seven times had to do with the fact that they were not keeping the rest of the land. That is why the 70 years is based upon this sabbatical cycle. And that's just 10 of them. And God's punishment meets the crime. So the whole issue here had to do with this land. It was supposed to rest. It didn't rest. So God's going for, for 490 years. And so God's going to force it to rest for 70 years. But we have 70 years for the land. We have 70 years for the temple. 
There's different periods of 70 years. There's different periods of 490 years. And, and these are all extremely important in understanding not just the past, but understanding the present. It is if we don't have a whole picture here of what's happening, then we're going to make a misapplication. Now, we know that there's Darius the Mede and Cyrus, and this movement has clearly established that Darius the Mede parallels who? Who does Darius parallel in our time? Reagan. Yeah, he's going to be Reagan. And then Cyrus is going to parallel... George Bush Sr. Yeah, so Bush the first, right? So, and that's well established. You know, we, we can see that that has to be correct because this is the time of the end of the 70 years. Now, there's two different times of the end in a sense, right? So that's where I was going back, showing those two 70-year periods. We have two here. Now, do we have two times of the ends marking our history, our line? Well, 1989. Yep. And 1991. Right. So we have 1989 and 1991. We have these two dates. It's a 777 days inclusive count between December uh, or November 9th, 2000. December 9th, oh boy, November 9th, 1989, and December 25th, 1991. Right. So that's 776 days if you did a cardinal count. But it's 777 inclusive. And in a sense, there's two times of the ends. So we have this doubling here. Now, do we have something like that in 1798 as well in, at, in that time of the end? Well, you could really at the captivity of the Pope in 1798. On his death in 1799. That, that's that's how I've understood it. So you're going to have a period of 50, 555 days, I think, or something around there. You could maybe count or near that. Yeah, I can't remember the number of days, but for February 15th, 1798 uh, to August 29th, uh, 1799. So if you figure out the number of days there. Um, well, I think that's uh, 560. 560 days? But he was actually removed from Rome on the 20th of February. So Yeah. yeah. So I know. There's a process. Different people give different dates. Um, I always mark February 15th. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, what's the actual date? Depending on how you're looking at that prophecy. But, yeah. So 560 if you count from February 15th, you're saying. And 555 if you count from February 20th. <clears throat> okay, so the point is we need to recognize the parallel between these histories. Now, there's some stuff going on in the chat. And so first thing, when it, you ask about a sabbatical cycle, so the question is where would we be now in a sabbatical cycle? I don't think we can say that we're anywhere in a sabbatical cycle. So first, there's more than one sabbatical cycle. So we've established um, that there is at least three. So, and, and to decide where the Jubilee cycles are, um, that's even more complex, right? Because you're going to look at these sabbatical cycles um, and I spent a lot of time looking at these and all the different arguments for the different sabbatical cycles. My conclusion is that um, the one that we see here is not actually the sabbatical cycle. So the one that we're talking about here in, in, in Daniel is symbolic. It's not based upon, we can't trace this back to any of our chronology earlier. Um, or at least, at least the Jubilee cycle here. 
Now, we know that Zedekiah was going to uh, initiate a jubilee, right? He was going to, because of the pressure from Jeremiah, he was going to have a jubilee year, but he backed off because of politics. And um, so if we try to place where that is, it doesn't really fit into any of these cycles. Yeah. So if we use the Sabbath in the book of Daniel, so Iran has talked about the Sabbath sabbatical cycle. Um, that is, we don't, this cycle here and 457 BC don't line up as sabbatical cycles, right? So sometimes we use the sabbatical cycle, we'll say, the 490 years, that's 10 jubilees, and we say that's the jubilee cycle. But if we use this one here that's um, dealing with the 70 years, and they're completed and it's a jubilee, you can see it doesn't match up, right? That there isn't, um, a, it doesn't match the other cycle. People understand what I'm talking about here with these Jubilee cycles. No, not cycle, if you mention there are three. I am just, <laughs> I'm totally, totally mixed up. Okay, so if we take this, maybe I'm just not meant to know it. I don't know. <laughs> I, I see because I think it's a moot point. Like to ask what is the sabbatical cycle presently. It. It's totally irrelevant. It, it has nothing okay. to do with, you know, so I've seen people who try to do something with it. The problem is which sabbatical cycle are you going to take? Because if you're going to take this one and we say, well, 536 is a Jubilee year. Well, then, you know, and I'll just do it here. So here's how we would do it. <clears throat> So we're going to say 536, 536 BC. And you would just keep doing, you know, cycles of 490. So you go minus 490. And of course, that's going to be 46 BC. And then you go minus 490 again. And you're going to get 444. If I minus, I have to add. Right. So. So that would be the Jubilee year would be 4455. And I can just keep adding 490s. Oh. 445 plus, okay. Plus 490. Quickly get up to, I mean, I could have done. So now we had 490 again. And it's going to say 2005 was the Jubilee year. Right. Uh, you added uh, 90 rather than 490. What's that? <laughs> so I have 445 plus 490. I did something wrong, you're saying? Yes. Okay, 1915. Okay, you're right. And then I go plus 49, 1964. So 2013 would be a jubilee year. If that was a jubilee year, then 2013 would be a jubilee year, right? And then we would say, you know, we have the sabbatical year is going to be uh, 20, and this is a jubilee year, right? So 2012 would have been the sabbatical, right? So 2019 would have been the sabbatical, right? If we use this cycle. But if we started with 457 BC and we subtract 490, whoops, I got all these things, I got to clear all that. 457 minus 490. Obviously, we're going to get 34 AD, right? You can see that. And then you go 34 AD plus 490 plus 490. Plus 490, plus 490. And then you're going to have 1994 as a Jubilee year, right? So 
But why do we not keep sabbaticals anymore? Well, because we don't live in the land of Israel. That would be the simple answer. But also, we have no idea what cycle to use. Right. So there would be no no way of knowing which cycle is the correct cycle, because even if we try to go back to um, our chronology of, uh, you know, when the Israelites left Egypt and then they entered the promised land. And then you're going to try to decide where you're going to count that Jubilee cycle from. I mean, you could count it from when they crossed the Jordan and entered the promised land. Um Nobody really knows. There's no, it's not really clear where you're going to count it from. So you're going to have just guesses. Um, you might count the sabbatical cycle, you know, before they get a jubilee cycle. But you just end up with a bunch of different uh, cycles. So they're, they're not, there's, you can almost pick and choose which year you want to be a sabbatical or a jubilee. And, and I've seen every single kind of imaginable um, jubilee sabbatical cycles that we're supposed to keep. So anyway, that's my view is that we, if we're going to look at these, these periods, and because even if you take the 70 years, because you got 70 years for the temple, 70 years for Babylon, 70 years at Babylon, if you're going to take those as, sabbatical cycles they're going to be different well we would say the 21 years from when daniel was taken captive to when jerusalem was destroyed that is three sabbatical cycles so at least that's the same sabbatical cycle right but the one uh, for babylon would be two years off from that and if we go back, because we did uh, a study on all these sabbatical jubilee cycles as they related to um, the seven years periods. So we had, uh, see if I can find this quickly. Probably not. So many jubilee things. Here it is. So we had this chart, and this chart addresses the sabbatical and jubilee cycles. And this isn't all of them, right? This is just, you're going to see, um, this one is going to have the 607 to 586. Right? You can see that here. Um, and then this sabbatical cycle is going to be the 457 one. To 408, right? So you can see that's two jubilee cycle or sabbatical cycles. And and there's these connect with the ones in the past, but this doesn't include Ezekiel's uh, sabbatical cycle. So that would be a third one. So there's at least three that we can identify here of sabbatical cycles that don't line up with each other. <clears throat> And any questions about that? Because my view is just that we can't make anything out about sabbatical or jubilee cycles at the present time. Other than we can see them in symbols, but not in the literal sense. We don't know which one to use. And since there's three of them, that's basically uh, three out of seven, every seven years has the potential for being a, a sabbatical year, right? Because there's three different cycles that we can find. So trying to put significance on something being a sabbatical year that becomes a bit of a problem because it's just slightly less than 50% chance. <clears throat> okay.
So let's go back to what we've what we're supposed to be studying, which is Daniel chapter 10. Um, oh, there was another question um, just here. I'm going to um, now there was this thing, Dwight, about Maccabees. Correct. And you were saying, what are you saying about that? Okay. Do you have the attachment that I sent to you? Um, um, what's it called? I have a whole bunch of attachments. Okay, just a moment. With there was the only PDF in the recent the the email I sent oh, to you last oh, night. Years. Okay. So this is sabbatical years based upon Okay. When when we were going through things at the camp meeting, mm -hmm. one of the comments that I presented had to deal with the fact that the year of rest for the land is noted in 1st Maccabees 6. Okay. So I recognize that that, men, that many do not have access to 1st Maccabees. But 1st Maccabees 6 verse 20 reads, so they came together and besieged them in the 150th year, and he made mounts for shot against them and for other engines. Now, the that's, way the Maccabean, that's the Maccabean calendar cycle, the 150th year. That's the cycle of from when the, the generals of Alexander had basically split up his empire. Yeah, so the Macedonian, it's the Macedonian year. <clears throat> so we're talking about the year of 163 BC, yeah. because this began approximately 313 BC, and that would have meant for the calendar that we would be looking to use that this would be in 163. Okay. Now, 1st Maccabees 649 and 653. Read as this. But with them that were in Beth Sharah, he made peace. For they came out of the city because they had no victuals there to endure the siege, it being a year of rest to the land. And 53. Yet at last, their vessels being without victuals, for that it was the seventh year, and they in Judea that were delivered from the Gentiles had eaten up the residue of the store. Now, in the Sabbath... So this, this chart here, interrupt you, but this chart here is just showing seven-year cycles uh, going from 90 AD backwards to 723, right? Correct. Now, all of the years that are highlighted in green, we have made a note of different events that have come in those years. We know that as a symbol, from 457 to 408, we have the first 49 years of the 490 that we see in Daniel 9. Right. As you had pointed out at the camp meeting, this from 457 to 408 is a symbol. The walls were not completed in 408. The walls were likely completed in 436. Because we said that that is in, in roughly the 20th year of the reign of Ahasuerus. 4, 444 is the 20th year. So, well, all right. I was... 444. Okay. Now... Is it 
seventh year is 457, then it's 13 years later. Okay. You, you just subtract 457 from 13, you get 444. Well, as, as we have addressed several times, of course, the years since we are, are counting down would have been in whatever calendar we're using, 444 to 443. Right. Um, yes, it's going to start in the spring of 444, and then end in the spring of 443. Okay. Now, 723 means for us the year in which northern Israel was taken captive. Mm -hmm. And so we and we know that we have a sabbatical cycle for that. That lines up with 457. That's going to be 30, 38 sabbatical cycles from 723 to 458. Right. So we had a chart that I showed you. Um, so when we go from 723, we have all these different spans of time. Uh, 723 is going to be 1127 years to um, 1798. That's going to be, um, let me see here. No, it's going to be uh, 25, 20 years to 1798. Pardon me. Right. That's 360 times seven, right? So we know that. And then we can take 70, not 798 and we can go back to 457 and it's going to be 2254. Uh, so that's going to be 320 times seven, right? So that's obviously just taking off the 38. 38 times 7 between 723 and 457. So that was one cycle that we have. But we also have this other cycle that doesn't include these two dates, right? That are, because here you can see you don't have um, uh, 586 on here, you right? You have 5, what's the closest? Is 555, 5... 5 583. 583, right? So you got 583. So that's like three years off of that cycle. And then you have well, 590. That's going to be four years the other way, right? So you can see it's it falls in between there. So when we had this chart, I know this chart's not easy to look at, but this chart has, has both of those cycles. And we can connect these cycles back to the plenty and famine and um and also to Leah and Rachel. So the two periods of seven years here and the two periods of seven years as well, um, those end up uh, connecting. Um, and then we have uh, the 731 BC, that's gonna connect to 723 BC, right? So that's another cycle and then um, that's also going to line up with the conquering and the allotment of the land because that's going to be um, 252 years, which is 7 times 36, so from 1479 B.C. back to 1731. So there's all these different structures, but this is showing basically two cycles um, that appear to be unrelated to each other. But they're, not, they're not really connected. So this one has the 586 BC. That's going to be connected to the anointing of Saul, right? Because that's going to be 490 plus the three weeks to 586. Well, as I said in my email, I was looking at this as a, a type of Hiram Edson style argument. Mm -hmm. Well, it connects to 723 BC, so that would connect to the to the cycle that Hiram Edson has. Right. The seven, but you can see 1798 is part of that cycle, but 1844 is not, right? Because it's 46 years from 1798 to 1844, and that's not a 49-year period. It's not something that's divisible by seven. So we know that the 2300 days cycle um, 
that's going to be uh, unconnected to to that in in a sabbatical cycle way. So that's part of the part of the problem there that people well, have with sabbatical cycles. So so we can see it connects to higher medicines. Um, cycle that one in Maccabees. So that must be a cycle that they were keeping, but it's not the cycle. Like there no. isn't a cycle. It's definitely not the cycle of 457. And it's not the cycle of, of his. The situation that, that I was looking at that I found interesting when we were addressing specific years in which there were events that could be tied to the children of Israel at that time. Mm -hmm. Of those seven-year cycles, <clears throat> of the years that are highlighted on that chart that was just up, mm -hmm. 317 B.C. was the year of the league the improper league that Ptolemy the first Soter made where he married his wife's lady in waiting mm -hmm. 254 BC was the beginning of the Roman Macedonian wars mm -hmm. 191 BC was where the midpoint of the 434 year period where Rome defeated Greece at Thermopylae and began their ascension as the, the nation of iron. We were addressing points about this regarding the Judean revolt and what my source had been to place it at 128 BC. Yeah, Six now, uh, these, uh, sorry to bother you. So these here, you can see these are all lined up. These. Right. But what, what you have here is uh, one, two, three, four. So you're lining them up like this is uh, the dis distance between here and here is going to be 63. So these are. Nine times seven. Correct. So you have them every ninth uh, sabbatical cycle for these ones to line up, right? So it's not it's not a forty nine year cycle. It's not a seventy year cycle. It's a sixty three year cycle, right? I'm, That's yes, that is correct. Okay. And the only thing that I was looking at there is because these were lining up as portions of a 126-year cycle. Mm -hmm. So portions of, now if it's 9 times 7, wouldn't a 126-year cycle be 18 times 7? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So here again, we have 187 coming into play. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is significant, you know, like I'm not trying to dismiss it. But I'm just saying that we can make too much about sabbatical cycles at the present time. Right? That's all I'm saying. I'm so we hear this is important in this history. Right? And right. and we can see how it's tied to the 723. And and so there's lots of implications in that. It's tied to 457 because 457 is is tied to 723 by a cycle of 38 seven seven year periods right and of course 458 you would just not add um, another <coughs> seven to that so that would be 45 sabbatical cycles between 723 and 408 right <coughs> so, so we can see that these line up um, yeah, so if you, Stephen, put there uh, Ezekiel's Jubilee in 622, 54 times 49 would give you 2025. So 
So we have the, these three different cycles. And so if you looked at the present time, and especially if you put in Jubilee years, right, if you decide something is a Jubilee year, um, technically, you, you could say um, six out of seven um, cycles can produce, if you decide something's a Jubilee year, um, a day that's a year that's supposed to be a rest year, right? So it just doesn't fit in. But this year, I would agree, this here is this significance in this history, dealing with Maccabees. So these are connected to 723, 457, and 408, as well as 27 AD, right? So of all these dates in 34 AD, these are all connected. So the seven, and, and we know that 191 is the center of the 62 weeks, right? Right. So, so this is all part of the 70 week cycle. That is that history is addressing um, the 70 weeks, right? Symbolically. And we can take that history and we can apply it to our times. We can make an application of it. But what we wouldn't do is take these years, 723, and then try to find the cycle and then say whatever year lines up with 723 present, presently is somehow a significant year because it's a part of that cycle. And I, I, I don't believe that we can take these sabbatical cycles uh, past 1844 and find any significance in them. Right, that, that's the position we take. If you if somebody's trying to tell me this year is a sabbatical year and it's significant and we should pay attention to it, I I just don't think that that's relevant, right? Because because I've I've worked on these things for well since eighty five, so looking at all the different things people have said about jubilee and sabbatical cycles, and uh, there's just there's just no evidence that we can do anything with them presently, but we can look at them here in the past and see that this is significant. So, especially, you know, the 191, the 317, because 317 is a symbol of the week of Christ, right? Right. In the midst of the week. So we can definitely see that, that that is correct. And then this one is in your studies that you did uh, here in the Duke. So, so, you know, we can, we can look at this and we can say, well, this is all significant. And it's these 18 uh, sabbatical cycles as well between these two dates, 126 years. Right. <clears throat> Okay. So, I mean, it's something we have to address. Um, there's no doubt about it in, in studying this because we have um, these symbols here. Now, the 21 days, right? The, the significance of that is 21 plus 49 is 70, right? Right. That was, that was kind of the point that I was making is that we have this um, he fasts for three full weeks. He was mourning three full weeks, right? He ate no pleasant bread, neither came, came flesh or wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. So however we look at that, 21 inclusive days or 21 cardinal days, doesn't really matter. The symbol is 21, and I'm saying that it represents the 21 years from Daniel's captivity to the destruction of Jerusalem, and then the 49 years from the destruction of Jerusalem to the end of the 70 years, those then are related. And then, so you're going to have those 49 years. And then the 50th year, the Jubilee year, is going to be the year in which they return to Jerusalem, right? Does that make sense to people, why, why I'm saying that? Because we have the 49th year. 
right? And he's in the midst of the 49th year. That is in the fall of, of 537, Cyrus comes to the throne. That's going to be the 49th year of a cycle. And then the fall of 536 is going to be the 50th year. And that's going to be when they return to the land. So, so if we go to Ezra, uh, it's going to be in, I'm trying to remember which chapter it is. Yeah, here it is, chapter 3, Ezra chapter 3. And when the seventh month was come and the children of Israel were in the cities, the people gathered themselves together as one man to Jerusalem. Then stood up Yeshua, the son of Josedach, and his brethren the priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and his brethren, and built the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings thereon as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. So they're going to set up this altar on the first day of the seventh month. And and, they're, and notice they're going to keep, uh, it says in verse four, they kept the feast of tabernacles as it is written and offered daily burnt offerings by number, according to the custom as the duty of every day required. Now, they're not going to mention anything about the day of atonement. Right, you know, mentioned the mor morning and evening burnt offerings that they're going to offer upon there, and then they're going to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And then it says in verse six, from the first day of the seventh month began they to offer burnt offerings unto the Lord, but the founda foundation of the temple of the Lord was not yet laid. Right, and that's going to be in the second year of their coming of the house of God to Jer at Jerusalem in the second month. Right. So it's going to be the second year in the second month that they're going to lay the foundation of the temple. But the point is they return to the land at the time, which would be according to this cycle from when the temple was destroyed in the 50th year. So there's this question about um, the new moons and the Sabbaths, uh, Isaiah 66, 23. I mean, I would take it as symbolic if you read the whole chapter. It'd be pretty hard to take this chapter literally um, in the sense that, I mean, this is talking about in – you know, uh, symbolically at the end of the world. So I'm not sure how that relates to what we're studying. Well, I would take out literally, but applying it to the new heaven and the new earth. Yes, this is a new heaven and a new earth, right? But what I mean literally we're not going to observe the new moons and the and and the Sabbaths here are referring to what Sabbaths? It's not the seventh day Sabbath. Okay. Well, we we apply it that way, but would that make sense in the context of this verse? I mean, this, I, mean, I agree with you. If we apply it as the seventh day Sabbath, this would be in the new, new earth. But as far as the new moons and the Sabbaths, normally those are put together as being like in all, all the other places of scripture, when you talk about new moons and Sabbaths, you're talking about uh, feasts. So I guess there would be a debate over this one. But we, we've always applied it to the seventh day Sabbath. 
Then you get into gray areas and feast days. Well, well, yeah, see, the, the feast keepers take this as uh, the feasts. And they have good linguistic uh, reasons for that. But let's just keep that aside because that's not really going to help us in what we're studying here. The main point that we're trying to get here is that this 21 days is a symbol. And we need to establish this symbol because it relates to our time as a symbol. Right? Because we're going to be putting these on a line, and then we're going to start to see how this line relates to our present time. So we need to recognize first that Daniel is in the first year of Cyrus, according to Daniel 1, verse 21. That this third year of Cyrus that he's talking about is actually the first year of Cyrus. That is, it's 536. And it's the first month, and it's going to be on the 24th day of the month, that he's beside the great river, which is Hittical, which is the Tigris River. So he's at the Tigris River. He's in Babylon. He's not in vision at the Tigris River, as he is in chapter 8 when he's in vision at the Uli. When he's at the Uli, that's in vision. He's not actually there. Right? But here in Daniel 10, he is actually at the Tigris River. He's, he's actually mourning three full weeks. And when they're fulfilled, the 4 and 20th day of the month, as he's by the side of the great river, which is Hittical, he lifts up his eyes and looks, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of Uphaz. His body also was like the barrel, and his face as the appearance of lightning, and his eyes as lamps of fire, and his arms and his feet like in color to polished brass. And the voice of his words, like the voice of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. For the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell upon them so that they fled to hide themselves. Therefore, I was left alone and saw this great vision, and there remained no strength in me, for my comeliness was turned in me into corruption, and I retained no strength. Right. So we use this, this last part as a classic example of what happened with uh, Sister White in her visions. Right, she, she's um, sort of struck down with this vision, right? Um, so there's no strength that he has. And then behold, a hand touched me. Oh, no, what, I skipped a verse here. Yet heard I the voice of his words. And when I heard the voice of his words, then was I a, a, in a deep sleep upon my face. And my face toward the ground, and behold, his ha and hand touched me, which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright. For unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. And then he said unto me, fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thy heart to understand and to chasten thine, thyself before God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, uh, it says here one of the chief princes, which is not what it says in Hebrew, uh, came to help me. And I remain there with the kings of Persia. So we can see at the beginning of the 21 days, Daniel's prayer was heard. So why has it been delayed 21 days for uh, him to come to respond? It required... Christ to intervene 
rather than Gabriel. Okay, so so this is Gabriel speaking, right? Yes. Okay, because he's going to be talking about Michael. Um, but Gabriel's not going to come with a word to Daniel until a battle has been fought and won by Michael, by Christ, right? Mm -hmm. Now, it says one of the chief princes. So um, now the word princes here in this, in this context, um, this is the word Tsar. Now you're going to have also, you have the king of Persia, but it's going to talk about um, the prince of the kingdom of Persia, right? So it says the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me, and that's the word Tsar, right? So you're going to see that's the Tsar, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one in 20 days. Lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, says, now, it says, of the chief, well, this word here is uh, Rishon, which is based on the word Rosh, and it's going to have Sarim, it's plural, princes. It actually means uh, the chief of the Sarim. He's, he's the supreme chief. That's why the word one, this word one here, 259 is Ichad. It means actually a unity. There's another one, Yochid, which means a singular. Even though this is um, looks like the word one, you can trans them both, translate them both as one. But Ichad is, means a unity. So this is Michael, right? The one who is like God, right? Who is like God? So it's usually given as a challenge. And this is the great controversy between Michael and Satan. Here Satan's referred to as the prince of the kingdom of Persia. So we're not taking that this is the king of Persia. This is the prince of the kingdom of Persia. So why is Satan referred to as the prince of the kingdom of Persia? Because this is Christ and Satan. Michael is always mentioned in conflict with Satan. So why is Satan referred to as the prince of the kingdom of Persia? Why doesn't it say just Satan? Sort of a... Cyrus would be the king. Right. So, in a sense, Satan has... Some authority over those who are, are not in Christ. Mm -hmm. and, um, in the sense that he would be seeking to control the kingdoms of the world, mm -hmm. particularly the mind of Cyrus, right. to influence him for his kingdom's sake. Yeah. yeah, so we know then that the leaders of this world, there is a great controversy going on in their minds. Because God is trying to influence them to do good, right? But they have, they're controlled by the prince of the kingdom, of, you know, like Trudeau. He's controlled by the prince of the kingdom of Canada, um, right? That's who he's controlled by. And any president, any leader, either he's controlled by Christ or he's controlled by Satan. And so in this context here, this is a battle going on in the mind of Cyrus. So Michael, who is, he's, he's the archangel. He's the one over all, right? He came to help me. So Gabriel is being helped. Um, and then it says, I remain there with the kings of Persia. So he's going to stay there. Now, why does it say the kings of Persia? Is 
Does that make sense? Maybe the kings, you know, in the past, maybe in the past, up to the present, that present. Yeah, yeah I, I just don't think it's good translation. Um, because you can translate it as the kings of Persia. Okay, if you were to take a look at letter 201, 1899, paragraph 6. Okay. And that's on of the Daniel 10 document that I sent to you. You'll find that on page 11. Okay, so I'm just trying to find it here. So the Daniel 10, page 11. Right. Okay, and just starting at the beginning here? Or okay. the second? If we... Is, if we we start at the beginning. It gives a little background. Yeah. So we read again in Daniel. Then said he unto me, fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to hasten thyself before thy God. Thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. By this we see that heavenly agencies have to contend with hindrances before the purpose of God is fulfilled in its time. The king of Persia was controlled by the highest of all evil angels. He refused, as did Pharaoh, to obey the word of the Lord. Gabriel declared, he withstood me 21 days by his representations against the Jews. But Michael came to his help, and then he remained with the kings of Persia, holding the powers in check, giving right counsel against evil counsel. Good and evil angels are taking a part in the planning of God in his earthly kingdom. It is God's purpose to carry forward his work in correct lines in ways that will advance his glory. So here we could take it as kings of Persia, going to be all the continuing kings after that. Right. So it is, it is God's purpose to carry forward his work in correct lines in ways that will advance his glory. But Satan is ever trying to counterwork God's purposes. Mm -hmm. Only by humbling themselves before God can God's servants advance his work. Never are they to depend on their own efforts or on outward display for success. Mm -hmm. So all of this section from what Mrs. White had written has to do with the Marah vision that Daniel had experienced, the third of these visions, the looking glass vision. So here is Michael. Here is one who is like God that is contending with the leaders of Persia, even though our adversary and his minions are also contending for them mm -hmm. now does this help us in any way understand this passage yeah well this is this is kind of the point that we've been making right right this is this is exactly um, this is exactly the point the point here is that we have this conflict between Christ and Satan occurring in the mind of Cyrus. And this is also happening within the other leadership. Right. Right. So Gabriel's there. He's causing protection for God's people because God's will is going to be worked out. Now, if you follow into the next document, the non-published document, Okay. Come to come to the fourth paragraph. Okay. So this is you're saying just on that same page. Yes, follow 
follow that page and go to the page right after. Because you're going to look at manuscript 95, 1903, paragraph 4. Okay, so this here. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar. Right. So it's going to go through the same thing. Right. Now, if you drop down yeah. in, these, in these scriptures. In these scriptures, scenes in the heavenly courts are brought to our view. Angels of the highest rank in the kingdom of God are represented as taking an interest in the affairs of men. Both the good and evil angels take an active part in matters connected with the earthly kingdoms. Daniel afflicted his soul before God. His earnest prayer moved a mighty angel from heaven to come to his relief. But satanic forces were working upon the mind of the king of Persia to prevent him, if possible, from doing the work that would answer Daniel's prayer. Michael himself, the archangel, came to the assistance of Gabriel. And then she states a similar scene of controversy is portrayed in the third chapter of Zechariah, which we completed this last Sabbath. Yeah, so, so this is exactly what I'm saying, right? So this she's just, and of course, I've read all of these statements. That's why I'm saying what I'm saying. Right. So this, this is the point, that this is a conflict going. Now, the thing that she never does is she never says specifically what, what is being, what the issue is at that time. She sometimes refers to it vaguely. Um, I can't remember the word she uses. But even here, like doing the work that would answer Daniel's prayer. But Daniel's prayer here must be the prayer in regard to returning to Jerusalem. Right. right. So um, Brittany, back in 2019, uh, she, Way before then. Hmm? Before then, because when wasn't she out at 2019? No, this is in early 2019. All right. Okay. So in 2019, Brittany, uh, let me see if I can find. Uh, um, this goes back a ways. Um, yeah, because that's going to be, I don't know, let's see it here. Um, can't find it. Anyway, it's in 2019 we had these, um, um, I don't know why it doesn't show up. Anyway, there was this discussion that I had with her regarding uh, Daniel chapter 10. And she tried to argue that this was two, this, the third year of Daniel was um, 534 BC. And that this was talking about something after the people had returned to the land. Um, but that, that to me is a hard thing to take. And it, it, and it's mostly just because Ellen White's vague about it, right? She doesn't s directly state, you know, Daniel's praying and the decision here is about the decree, right? But we've taken that position and partly because Daniel 1 verse 21 tells us that Daniel continued even unto the first year of Cyrus. So, so we're saying that this third year is there. The, the same year. Um, but when we look at what Ellen White's saying, that there is an answer to Daniel's prayer. So if we look at what he's, the context of what he's talking about, he doesn't even himself say exactly what the prayer is. Right? He was just praying. But if we look at the answer, the answer is what's going to happen in the future. 
in the great controversy between Christ and Satan as it works out in these nations against God's people. Right? So if we look at the answer, the answer is in Daniel 10, 21, where it says, but I show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth. And there is none that holdeth with me in these things, but Michael, your prince. And then, even though there's a chapter break, so I know we skipped a bunch here, but we'll come back to that. Even though there's a chapter break, it actually is the same vision, right? And then it says, also I in the first year of Darius the Mede, even I stood to confirm and strengthen him. Now, what sometimes people do when they see this, they just think chapter 10 is, you know, the third year of Cyrus and chapter 11 is the first year of Darius. I mean, I've had discussions with people who try to, you know, say that this is not the same vision or whatever. Um, but we know he's just going back and referring in the first year of Darius. I also have to confirm and strengthen him. Right. And that's going to be the year in which Babylon falls. So, again, he's connecting these two different times of the end. He's going back to the end of Babylon, October 13th, 539. And then he's going to address the end of the captivity, which is going to be in 536. So that, that's the context where we get to chapter 11. But there's still some more things that we have to look at in chapter 10 before we get to chapter 11. But we can just see that this is the same controversy now being shown worked out in the future. So once this is set in place, once this, um, this answer to Daniel's prayer occurs, then Gabriel can come to Daniel and say, and Christ can come and say, here is what's going to happen. Here is how history is going to unfold. But it was contingent upon that decision of Cyrus. And we're going to have to look at Cyrus a little bit more as well. Right? We, we've looked at Cyrus before. We know he's a type of the Messiah. Right? He's the Lord's anointed. So, so Cyrus's role uh, here is um, typical as well. So, because we're gonna we're gonna try to lay out um, not just you know who these kings are, but we're gonna lay, lay out them on a line, which is the line of the decrees. So we're gonna have that established. I know this is a lot of preliminary work, but if we just jumped into Daniel chapter 11 and then tried to interpret these verses without the background, we could be misled. I mean, obviously, we've studied these things before and we know the background. But people often ignore that information when they want to make an interpretation of Scripture because what is one of the Miller's rules about scripture? The Bible interpret itself. And we have to bring all of the scriptures together that address a particular point. So we can't just pick and choose. We can't ignore scriptures. And, and to understand even this, this role of Cyrus and how it relates once we look at the parallel in our time is, is extremely important in, in understanding Daniel chapter 11, the last vision, Daniel's last vision. And seeing how much time we have. So let's go back here to, because what we were talking about is Cyrus. So Cyrus, um, let's get my, Right, is Koresh. So remember uh, David Koresh, David Koresh, uh, Waco, 
right? So he he called himself Koresh because he believed he was uh, a messiah, right? And Koresh or Cyrus, the Greeks call him, um, he's going to be mentioned in the scripture. Right? So he's mentioned in Isaiah 44 and 45. Um, we'll just start here, verse 28. Um, well, 27. So this is talking about the, the Lord who can confirm things, right, by his word and by the word of his servant and for, performs the counsel of his messengers. Verse 26, I'm reading, that saith to Jerusalem, thou shalt be inhabited. And to the cities of Judah, ye shall be built. And I will raise up the decayed places thereof. That saith to the deep, be dry. And I will dry up thy rivers. That saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure. (coughs) Even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built. And to the temple, thy foundation shall be laid. And in chapter 45, continues, thus saith the Lord to his anointed. So that was the word Mashiach, to Cyrus, to Koresh, whose right hand I have holden to subdue nations before him, to loose the loins of kings. So that's Belshazzar, to open before him the two leaved gates. So we know that's uh, when he goes into the city. He comes in under, with the dry river, and it says he's going to open before him the two leaved gates, and the gate shall not be shut. And I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut in sunder the bars of iron. And I will give thee the treasures of darkness and hidden riches in secret places. So that's Babylon, right? So that's that's referring to Babylon. We would agree with that. The treasure of the treasures of darkness and the hidden riches of secret places. Sounds logical. Yeah. Right. That thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which call thee by thy name and the God of Israel. For Jacob, my servant's sake and Israel, mine elect, I have called thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. So God is naming uh, Cyrus um, more than 100 years before he's born. If I remember correctly, I figured it out once. So more than 100 years before his birth, God is going to say, I've called thee by thy name. And so Cyrus is going to be brought According to the spirit of prophecy, by Daniel, he's going to be brought, uh, this prophecy is brought to his attention. At least it's implied that that's what happens. But now Cyrus has to go through a decision, right? He has to make a decision. He has to go through a process of decision making. Is he going to issue this decree to saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built? Is he going to call for the fount, laying of the foundation of the temple? Is he going to allow the Israelites, the Jews, to return to Jerusalem? That's the decision he has, has to make. So that is what Daniel is praying about. It, it has to be. Even though Ellen White doesn't specifically say it, if we're going to argue that this is like two years later, the, the decree has already been issued. Um, we have no evidence that, that Cyrus tried to oppose the Jews in any way. And, and it wouldn't really make sense in this context. And it's giving us a specific date, too, which would confirm, because if he gets this vision on the 24th day of the first month, and that's when the decree is issued. 
Does that give enough time for the Israelites to return to Jerusalem to lay the foundation or to to set up the altar on the first day of the seventh month? Okay, I I have an odd question. Okay. We are dealing with this as being a prophetic vision, right? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Dan, you're talking about this in Isaiah or talking about in Dan? In Daniel. Yeah. Okay. What if this, is it possible that this could be referring more to false smirtus and the attempt that they made not to allow the Jews to, to proceed with rebuilding the temple? Well, I don't see how, because this is about Cyrus. Right. Now, what is what is the name Cyrus mean? Korish uh, itself. Yeah. Uh, uh, possesses possess thou the furnace, according to Brown Drivers Briggs, and doesn't say anything in Strong's. Possesses thou the furnace. Didn't false Smyrtus also possess the furnace? Yeah, but but false Smyrtus, you know, you're going to have Cambyses. And like this context of this is in the context of Cyrus, right? This is talking about Cyrus. Maybe I don't understand what you're saying. But uh, because Cyrus is going to issue this decree. Right. So, so that sets in motion everything. And then, yeah, we're going to have these different kings who are going to be opposing it, like, uh, you know, false Smyrtus. You know, he's going to stop the building of the temple. And then under the prophesying of Zechariah and Haggai, they'll commence the building of the temple. And then... Darius the Great, you know, he's going to be appealed to, you know, what are these people doing building their temple? They're bad people. But Darius is going to do a search of the records and find the original decree of Cyrus. Now, false Smyrtus doesn't really care, and he doesn't find the original. He just looks at the fact that, that they were a trouble to Babylon when he looks at the records. They weren't... Uh, you know, is you know that's that's just the issue there with um, <clears throat> false smirtus, right? Okay. So, so I don't know. I don't quite understand your question. I guess how this could relate to false smirtus. Well, false smirtus was the one that gave the most trouble to the children of Israel. Now, it's very possible that uh, that this is, of course, referring to strictly Cyrus, but where was Cyrus giving trouble to Israel? He seemed to be issuing a decree that was very favorable. Right, so that's the point, is this is Cyrus He's going to have this battle in his mind before he issues the decree. Because we're saying this is in the first year of Cyrus. So he's been king for six months. He knows about the book of Isaiah, and what it says about him. And he's going through a mental battle where Satan is, is trying to influence him and Christ is trying to influence him. Christ is going to be victorious. And so I take it that the reason that the angel Gabriel and Christ can come to Daniel on the 24th day of the first month is because the decree is issued on that day. So Cyrus now issues the decree and Daniel can be told this. That's that's what's implied. But it's not it's not 
explicitly stated what Daniel is praying for, that he's praying for the issuing of a decree. And it's not clearly told that that's why, you know, Gabriel can now come to him. But when it says that in verse 21, but I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth. Um, just and that that and there is none that holdeth with me in these things. That means there's no one else that that knows about these things but Christ, but Michael, your prince. So we're together on this issue. We know about what's happening. And, and we're going to explain to you what this is all about, that this issue here dealing with Babylon being conquered by Medo-Persia and then Medo-Persia issuing this decree, it doesn't matter. There's going to be a bunch of other things, or not Medo-Persia, um, Persia, right, because this is going to be Cyrus, Persia issuing this decree. And then he's going to say in verse 20, it says, lo, the prince of Grisha shall come, right? So Daniel's being told a bunch of things he's not really wanting to hear. He wants the answer to the prayer, just as he has in the other visions. But then God gives him something more. And so this unfolding of this history is something that, that we need to understand. Why it's written in this way, why it unfolds in this way what the issues of the great controversy are um, in this context. And then with that, we can make an application to our time. But anyway, our time's up. So hopefully that's helpful as we're going through this. I know we're going rather slowly because it's just easy to jump into chapter 11. But I think it's important to establish these points. So let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are very grateful for the study this morning. We need your presence. Um, I pray that everyone who is studying these things can come to understand them. If there's things that are wrong in our thinking, we ask, Lord, that you can correct us. Um, I know I've looked at these things many times and I might be a bit stubborn about some of them, but um, I know, Lord, that you can correct us in spite of that. And uh, pray, Lord, that you can be with each person, that your angels can watch over them. And thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.